welcome to the 2022 uh, Sheep to Shawl competition for Lambtown Festival. This is the judging for the uh, virtual division. We have added a new little wrinkle as we return to an in-person show for 2022. And the way that the competition is done this year, we have uh, two separate divisions. So that's kind of a, a, a new thing there. And the one division is virtual, meaning the shawls have already been done. Uh, as it stands right now, we are a week away from the festival and we had the shawls in hand a week ago. So two weeks before the event, the shawls are already all done. And what we're gonna do today in this video here, we are going to uh, hear their placements. We're gonna see uh, who got first, second and third in that particular division. And when it comes to the actual in-person show when we get to the fairgrounds on on Sunday at about three o'clock once all those teams are done weaving their shawls and they have them off the loom that is when uh, we'll figure out who's the fairgrounds division winner and then the winner of both divisions go head to head and we get a grand champion so it's really uh, a really fun way to include people from around the country at our in-person festival. So thank you everybody for joining us. And I, I do wanna thank our three teams who competed in the virtual division this year. It was uh, really fun to see those shawls come in. And I also wanna say uh, not just a, a welcome, but a thank you to Kay and Sand who are our judges once again this year. Uh, if you all watched uh, in 2020 and 2021, you're familiar with them. Uh, they did a great job and looking forward to what the two of you have to, to say about our judges today. I'm, I should say what you have to say about our shawls today. <laughs> so uh, the way that we're going to do this is we're going to show a brief slideshow of each of the shawls. And uh, we'll start with shawl one from the first team and then we will watch a video that they put together. One of the things that each of the teams in the fairgrounds division does is they have to have a educational component. So most of the time it's a poster board and they talk about their process and things like that. And we really wanted to make the virtual uh, division as close to the in-person division or the festival division as we could. And so one of the things that we required of the virtual division was that their entry had to be accompanied by a brief video. I think they all came in right around six or eight minutes. And so we will watch the slideshow and we'll hear the judges feedback on the shawl. And then we're gonna hear from the teams about how they did it. So we'll, we'll watch a shawl in that same video and then we'll see the next shawl in that video. We'll progress through that way and then uh, then we'll hear the results. So Kay and Sand, is there anything you'd like to say before we take a look at the first shawl? Just a little bit of historical background on Sheep to Shawls. This was a way for the community to come together for people to step out and show their ability to do these tasks, which at one point were really critical to our existence, you know, clothing, we didn't need clothing. And so this was actually something that helped identify the best of what was available in terms of workmanship, workpersonship in, the, in this field. So keep that in mind, do we have a luxury today that this is primarily a luxury a privilege to be able to do, but it was actually a critical function not so many years ago. And we also just wanted to kind of do a, a very brief overview of what a sheep to shawl includes. Um, because if you are a competitor, you got a lovely two page um, set of rules and a little video um, with us nattering on about what you should do. But um, this is a little bit more general audience. so. Um, this competition was set up to mirror an in-person competition in terms of the number of hours worked, uh, but it divides a little differently. Um, so if you have a seven person team and you have four hours to complete your shawl, you do a little multiplication and suddenly you have 28 hours of work time. So and the virtual teams had 28 hours total, which does not include warping or any preparation for the warp of the yarn. That only includes processing a washed fleece through to yarn and then 
weaving it onto the loom in the weft, which for those who are not familiar, that's the horizontal threads of a woven piece. That time also does not include shipping if you have a, uh, a team that is um, remote based, uh, you get your shipping time free. Um, and this is an advantage to the virtual version of a sheep to shawl like this because we do see teams where there's people all over. They're not coming together in person. They are all over the place, which is wonderful mm -hmm. for in terms of building community. So your team can have up to four spinners, one carter, one plier and one weaver. And of course, if you have a smaller team, you can double up. Um, <clears throat> you track your time. <clears throat> and in this case, you wanna get your video shot as you're going along, <clears throat> excuse me, so that you can edit your um, fantastic educational video. Um, and then it comes to us. And generally that happens because Henry Clemens calls me and says, I'll be driving down on Wednesday. <laughs> um, so, and then we actually um, take everything out into our studio and lay it out and pull out our judge sheets. And we try to work fairly quickly because we want, again, to mirror the experience in that person. you would have in person, um, which does not include an extended amount of time to um, pick over all the nitpicky little details. So well, in person that would result in 10 to 20 minutes per shawl, 20 minutes very very much on the long side per shawl. So we try to limit ourselves to that. And generally speaking, it works out fairly well like that. So all of that being said, we had a lovely time. And um, one of the things that I will say this year, which is super fantastic, is all of the shawls came in qualifying. Um, qualifying. So we didn't have any shawls that disqualified because they hadn't met the basic size parameters. So well so, done, teams. That's awesome. Um, so yeah, Let us let's see. roll. Let us okay. see you. All right. Let's do a little screen share. All right, are you guys seeing that? Yay. Okay. Give it a minute. Okay. So yeah, here, it's, here, running. it's yeah, running. It's running. Here's here's the three shawls. Okay. okay, team one. Team one produced a shawl with um, Romney in both the warp and the weft. Um, right here. Um, the, it is a hand spun warp and part of the warp is hand dyed as well. Um, one of the interesting things about this shawl is they added beads to some of the warp threads and it looks as though they did that by um, putting them onto the single and then plying them so that they remain stable and in position once the shawl is woven. And they are stable, I checked. <laughs> so well done for the spinner who put the beads in or the spinners who put beads in. It does qualify at 24 inches wide and 83 inches long as we measured it. And it had a, uh, I, yeah, so there's a stated wraps per inch for the yarn. I first thing I want to feedback on this particular shawl is that the set is a little bit too open. It will close up when it is fully wet finished, which for those who don't know is when you take your woven piece, you put it in water and give the fibers a chance to relax and bloom and fill in spaces, but it, it's still too open. The Romney. At this set, it has a lovely hand. It's very crushable. However, it is not next to skin soft. And so Romney is a mixed choice for something like this. I believe, yeah. So it, it makes, can depend on the sheep. It can depend. And if it's an outerwear or coat shawl, then it's fine. In fact, it will be really good because the Romney will actually do a better job of like water repelling. However, 
it is not next to skin soft. So that is something you want to put into your decision-making process mm -hmm. about what you use. The, as you can see from this picture, the knotting is beautiful. The fringe was really well done. There were, there's one color that is spun noticeably heavier or the resulting yarn is spun is is heavier than the other yarns and mm -hmm. it's a it's the and one of them is also spun slightly finer and one of the heavier ones is actually under plied so it has the appearance on the surface of the fabric as though it's a single and you have to really look at the weave structure to see both singles in what should be a two ply they are apparent in the fringe and then you can see where the under under plying is so it's really important for the spinners whoever your plier is don't get in a hurry okay yeah there we go i'll pop it back so you can finish yeah, thank on. you because i have a couple other things um a couple of the other things that i noticed with this shawl is there is a there is a broken warp thread along the selvage at um about I don't know, a quarter or a third of the way up. And from that point forward, there the weaver had a lot of difficulty managing the selvage um, evenly uh, because that warp thread broke along the selvage. So there are missed um, picks along so, one edge because of that. And the other thing, and this this is just something that I noticed in the shawl and I noticed in a lot of shawls, when you're working with a yarn that's this heavy, um, when you join your weft yarn, because you will inevitably run out and have to uh, join it, um, choosing a join that um, sandwiches two overlaps, overlaps two uh, strands of yarn in the in the uh, weft has a tendency to look like a beat error that doesn't go all the way across because it thickens the yarn in that area. So it's worth your time. Um, as a weaver to learn some different techniques for joining. And just as a um, quick piece of information for that, there is something called a split ply technique that you will not see the join in of the new yarn. It takes a moment or two more, but the end result in the texture of the shawl, I'm looking at the shawl down here, mm -hmm. the end result in the texture of the shawl is much better because you don't have that visual disruption of a thickened line. And you can see here, hold on, just pop it. There we go. There's the broken one. And from that point, you see the selvage becomes much more uneven. And like this side before the break, you can see that it's pretty even, although I will note that there's a lot of compaction here. So that's an issue and may so have contributed to the broken warp thread on the selvage. And the only other thing that I wanted to mention is when you're picking your pattern um, to lay over a striped warp. Um, be cognizant of where the pattern changes. So this shawl was woven in an extended twill, which means that an extended point twill. That's extended the point issue. twill. Yeah. Sorry, extended point twill, which means that you have a pattern that comes up to a point and then shifts and goes down, which is fine, except that one of those points occurred in the black stripe. And since the weft is um, most a, of you will see beige, that it's dark brown, by the way, but it is technically like it's, it's undyed. And I this is actually prefer, dyed. Which one, the black one? The black one is actually dyed. Okay, so yeah. it's actually dyed, and it looks like it might have been dyed over a. It's natural dyed over black, a, a natural black. Yeah, which looks dark brown to most people. But at any rate, so what happens then when that point occurs in that black um, stripe with a beige warp? Um, it really really pops out and looks really, really obvious. So okay, that's can point out one where the point is in that dark warp, dark mm -hmm. warp section, yep. and then where it isn't in the remaining dark right. warp sections. But you don't see that happen when you see over here, this is this red stripe also has a point turn but it right there, because but you don't contrast. see it in the same way. So just thinking about how you place your pattern relative to uh, your warp stripe colors. Um, is an important consideration. All right. Okay. Team two. Yeah. Uh, so first we're going to do the, the video. Oh, we're going to do the video. Team yeah. Yes. Team one. But I also want to say the, the points that you brought up there were great because we are going to have these shawls on display in the East Classroom building 
throughout the festival. So this is something that people will be able to walk up and be able to, to take a look at. So uh, let's hear at this point, what hear and see what team one had to say about their shawl and uh, they'll probably introduce themselves along the way.
That was pretty awesome. Well that was the done. First, first video. Just hit it out the park. That was pretty good. Yeah. Uh, the one thing I, I wanted to mention about this shawl, I don't know whether it's been said or not yet. Uh, the Romney was obtained from Mendenhall Wool Ranch up here in Northern California. So uh, thank you to that group for uh, supporting our, our local ranch. And uh, they are one of the Mendenhall is one of the staples at Lambtown Festival. That was bring a lot of sheep for the sheep show and uh, usually clean up at the wool show as well. So uh, nice to see them getting some love in there as well. Uh, any last comments from our, our judges before we move on to the slideshow for, okay. <clears throat> okay, so with that, I'll stop my video and we will move on to the next one. <clears throat> okay so there'll be a few seconds of this yep we'll, that's fine and we'll move on to the next that is a nice shot to show how even the fringe was on the previous shot <laughs> all right team two this has a bfl tussa silk hand spun warp and the weft was uh spun from a romney u it's uh 12 epi or well, that's what they were shooting for uh, yeah actually yeah yeah and 11 picks per inch is what they submitted um, the shawl length is 95 a generous 95 inches and uh with this 21.75 i love a good generous shawl they're always nice mm -hmm. uh go ahead so it's really well done it was the best shawl in terms of fringe manage, uh, sorry, in terms of selvage managers. The selvages are, are quite lovely. We can just, I, maybe, no. oh, you can kind of see it in the edge there. Look how nicely it falls in that image. You can feel the difference in the warp being a softer, more next to skin uh, fiber. It's got a really nice hand. Also, the Romney you used in the weft, uh, she was a softer sheep. So Romney's, you really have to judge um, fleece by fleece in terms of hand spinning desirability. The fringe is beautiful. Oh, that's Look a at great that beautiful shot. Fringe. It's even, it's tied gorgeous. And it's, twisted, it's, tied evenly. Yeah, so. Sits right up next to the fell line. And when you look at the twist across the fringes, every single one of them is so close in terms of how twisted they are. So they look very uniform and very clean. There is hem stitching on the shawl as well. And the hem stitching is beautiful. It's actually one of the best examples I've seen in a long time of this particular hem stitch technique, which reaches up into the warp. You can see there the turn point. There are no treadling errors on this shawl. There's no place at which the pattern is unintentionally broken. When you look at the picture on the left, you'll see the turn point intentional of the center of the shawl. It's beautiful. Mm -hmm. The pattern that was, there's a dyed pattern in the warp and it was extremely well executed. It shows up in the weaving. You can just see the edges of it right there on the picture on the left. Um, mm -hmm. You can see how evenly it is beat. So there's not 
a sure. lot of noticeable places where the beat, the amount of pressure to put the weft in place, it shows, although you can, whoops, you can just there we see go. one spot yeah. right under the fringe on the left side where it just looks like the pattern's a teeny bit different. And that's where the weft was placed with just a tiny bit less force. And again, this shall use that same technique to bury ends where there's an overlapped mm. set of threads. And again, um, this yarn is kind of heavy for using that technique. And so it does um, give the impression of a little bit of a beat error that doesn't quite go across. In this shawl, it's less obvious because the main, the background of the shawl where it's undyed um, tends to hide it a bit better because it's same color warp and weft. Um, this shawl was uh, dyed, the work was dyed using a technique called stenciling. Um, so it, there's some minor diameter irregularities, but only in the weft yarn. So that would have been the yarn that was spun during team hours. So I'm guessing that that's uh, getting a little bit brushed. It's not enough to detract from the pattern in part because of the very wise choice of the background being warp and weft, mostly the same color. That's a really good choice for a situation like this. So it's a good thing to keep in mind. We want the pattern to show up, but we don't necessarily want it to show something that doesn't need to be highlighted. The warp was well spun and stable. So very strong, good choice of twist for stability versus good hand. I'm incredibly cheerful with the, the hand spinning on this particular warp. And this team so. provided some information about their process, um, which uh, included one of our particular um, soap boxes, which is sampling. This team actually wove an entire shawl with no spun yarn to sample their pattern and their draft and their dye technique and, and all the various components. So they, this, this, once they sampled a full shawl, then they came back and they were able to actually implement any shifts or changes that they needed to make in their final shawl. So I cannot emphasize enough how important sampling is in your weaving process. Um, you got to hold the shawl up and actually show it moving because even the pictures don't do it justice. This shawl actually has that lovely meeting point of good crushability, nice drape, good flow in hand, while also being stable fabric. So it's neither too open nor too compressed. So the shawl doesn't feel like it's too heavy to bend. It's got a, a, it's just a perfect match of those two factors that can be very, can compete against each other. Do you go for hand or do you go for stable fabric? And also it, um, you know, if you kind of look back to the origins of Shape to Shawls, which um, at a lot of levels shows the community that you are, you, you, you are able to make a marketable product. This is definitely meets that goal. Absolutely. So, okay. I think that we are ready to roll video on this team. Since the COVID-19 pandemic lockdown of 2020, Lamb Chop Spin Along members have gathered virtually on Zoom. We are a gregarious bunch of fiber artists who delight in sharing all aspects of spinning, weaving, and fiber processing. The need to protect everyone's health meant we would not be gathering together or attending public events where we could demonstrate and share our enthusiasm for our craft. The reimagined virtual sheep to shawl of 2020 and 2021 as a timed socially distanced competition taking place on Zoom allowed us to participate with many spinning and weaving groups in a new way. The challenges of teamwork while apart included relying on fiber, yarn, and the finished shawl being delivered on time in the mail. 
along with the challenges of streaming the whole process live, which Lambtown Festival hosted with an extended schedule allowing teams to work independently and the public to watch safely from their homes. The new challenge for virtual teams in 2022 is the production of an educational video sharing the process of creating our shawl. Most Thursdays, Lamb Chops Spin Along join the Zoom channel for crafting and discussing sheep to shawl ideas. We talk over design themes, weaving drafts, and dye techniques. In the past, we had dyed warps and painted warps, but what about a stencil painted warp? We talk about what fibers to use and how to process them. Blueface Leicester and Tessa Silk Blend was chosen for the warp for its ability to accept dye well. The design of wings was decided on and a stencil cut. The warp painting was tested on a sample shawl woven of millspun yarn. Discoveries were made, the image design and dye technique refined, and we were ready to begin our shawl. This would be for Laura, our tallest member, so the wingspan needed to match her height and arm length. She wanted the design to evoke a ceremonial dance shawl for Hummingbird Clan. To create the shawl, it had to be woven twice. The warp was spun, plied, and wound onto the loom and stabilized with a temporary weft. Then it was pulled off the loom and onto a long table where the stencil could be put in place. Laura and Sela painted the wing design with chicard acid dyes that were thickened with sodium alginate to prevent the colors from spreading uncontrollably through capillary action. The tips of the feathers were dyed golden yellow, followed by hot fuchsia, violet, and turquoise at the center. The stencil was cleaned, flipped, and the process repeated to form the second wing. The warp was left in place for approximately four hours to set the dye. It was rinsed, dried, the temporary weft removed, then it was wound back onto the loom, finally ready to be woven. The fleece chosen for our weft yarn came from Lyra, a natural colored Romney ewe. She was the grand champion of Black Sheep Gathering in 2019. The clean washed fleece was hand teased by Judith and passed to Terry for drum carding into smooth bats ready for spinning. The bats were shared by Laura, Sela, and Judith. We gathered together for one short afternoon for a spinning circle in Sela's garden. The singles were plied and loaded onto shuttle bobbins, ready for Sela to begin the weaving. The weaving begins with a header of temporary yarn to test the weave and give stability to the warp. The hand spun weft yarn is woven for about an inch and a half, then the hem stitching is done to create a clean, finished edge. The simple twill draft chosen for its mimicry of feather texture works well with the painted warp. When the center of the wing design is reached, the direction of the twill is reversed to create the backbone of the design. The second half of the shawl is woven and the woven end is secured with hem stitching and then cut off the loom.
The shawl was misted and fulled lightly by hand drumming on the whole surface. It was left to rest on the table surface to dry out. Sayla twisted the fringe ends in bundles of three and three ends, plied together by hand for an elegant finish. Our winged shawl was complete, packed and sent on its way to Lambtown Festival. Thank you to all the Lamb Chop Spin Along members who processed, spun, wove, and cheered us along. We appreciate the work that Lambtown Festival has done to create a virtual sheep to shawl and send our grateful thanks for the opportunity to participate. Yours sincerely, Lamb Chop Spin Along. Well done. I, I have to say, I've not seen these videos yet. This is part of uh, the thing that I have not experienced yet. I, I got to see the shawls for just a little bit when they were getting photographed, but the, these videos are, are quite impressive. And so thank you to these teams for creating this. And they will be available as well as this judging. They'll all be available on YouTube later on, uh, as well as the, the judges notes, uh, your, your comments ahead of time, as well as uh, Kira's comments that she had for stains and textile. So if somebody has uh, something that they're submitting, uh, that's available as well. So, uh, you know, if you're thinking about competing in any of our events, uh, our skeins and textiles events for uh, Lambtown Festival, we do have these resources that will be available to you uh, on YouTube uh, to help you get started in the future to compete. So that was team two. We are going to move on to our third and final team, if you all are ready. We are ready. Okay, let me get this one queued up here. And again, it'll probably play for just a little bit on shawl number two, and there we go. There we go. So you can clearly see <coughs> the pattern on the shawl, which is a plus minus. The choice of the color of the warp with the dark color of the weft means that when you see the shawl in person, it has a little bit of that dizziness to it, which could have been dealt with by a slightly more open set or choosing the colors to be closer in value, which you can do by taking a picture of the two colors together and making it black and white to see how far apart they are. The Corydale in the warp is, is nice. Um, mm -hmm. I would be interested to know what the cross was because it does, it has a little crispness to it, the weft is uh, a, a nice quarry. Yeah. yeah, I think that the hand of the quarry in the weft <clears throat> is actually much superior to the hand of the quarry cross in the warp. Um, Which overall means that the shawl then becomes more wearable because the weft yarn actually softens the, the whole presentation. Um, it has a good hand, good drape. Um, so the set that they chose worked really well um, for this yarn. It, I believe this shawl is probably not wet finished. I think wet finishing would probably soften the hand of it considerably. It is, however, a heavy shawl. So it looks, look there though, I wanna really highlight this. This team also did hem stitching. That's quite nice. It's and beautiful. The, yeah, it is beautiful. Look, and everything's trimmed beautifully. And I will say that the choice you can just see here of the plain weave before starting the pattern is a really good choice in terms of stability of the end of a shawl. I will point out, however, that you do, the weaver does need to take into account that things may not sit the same at the edges when you go from plain weave to twills in particular, so so adjust your tension you have to accommodate. adjust your tension on those picks. Mm -hmm. And that is, this shawl is superior in the selvages in one aspect while being a drawback in another. The, you'll see from the pattern, the way it's a draping there in the picture on the right, there's very little compression of the pattern at the edges. Oh, there, that's a great picture right there to show it. Very little compression of the edges. However, it is quite loopy the weft makes noticeable loops on the edges. And because there's no floating selvage in the same colors as the weft, the loops are very 
prominent, looking a little bit like a barber pole, but you can see more easily where they're uneven and it make, visually makes the uh, selvage look more uneven than it actually is. Um, this, uh, that was in the video. Yeah. Okay, um, uh, uh, again, this shawl suffered from the same ends varying issue that um, all, in fact, all of these shawls did, which is that um, doubled up yarns on a fingering weight yarn too heavy. You can see that it looks like a pick error or a traveling like error. A, uh, beat error. Or a beat error. I mean, it can look like it. And when you go in and look, you mm -hmm. can see that it's because there's a doubled up section of yarn right there. Again, a different joining technique for new wefts would really benefit these mm -hmm. shawls, even though it takes an extra couple of seconds. There is inconsistency also in the warp yarns that you can... In the diameter. In the diameter, yeah. yeah. In fact, and there's one right yeah. here I can show readily. Let's see if I get close to the camera. See, those are very obviously not quite the same across all the items, all of the yarns in that. And then the one right next to it is actually quite fine by comparison. So that's an important thing because it changes the presentation on the shawl. We had some, there's two obvious treadling errors. It's a pick that was clearly out of pattern and they're so obvious. And weirdly, one occurred about a quarter of the way in, and then the other one occurred about a quarter of the way in from the... Well, no, about a third of the way. That's the, They weren't lined up because if they'd been they were, the same no, one way into the other, that would have helped. It would look like intentional. The turn point to do a diamond in the center is quite lovely. It's a really nice design choice. Mm -hmm. um, but there is, um, there's a pick error um, as the weaver came out of that diamond. Yeah. Um, so that kind of... Um, and the weft yarn does have some irregularities and they do take away from the pattern because this pattern is a very broad, I don't know if you can just hold that up. The pattern is very broad, so it's big. There's big fields of it being the same, which looks really nice and is a good choice for a competition like this. But the inconsistencies in the, right there, oh, that's a, that's an end fairy. So you have to flip it over. there you go is the problem, let me see if I can get this. This is the problem with the ends bearing. Do you see that big dark line right there? That's where two threads are sandwiched next to each other and it creates something that looks like an error when it's not actually an error. Right, um, and of course, any, any inconsistencies in the spinning of the singles and then the result in plying for the weft yarn will highlight that because inevitably it'll be a thick spot and a thick spot. It, it, they'll, they'll line up together. So they'll really be noticeable, whereas a split ply berry will actually help you out with that. There were noticeable, there were a couple of pick errors where there's um, a, like a single thread that's clearly in the wrong position. And again, the two treadling errors that are very obviously across the entire. And piece. the other thing that I wanted to note is that um, they, the team should have taken a more care when they did their ends trimming because there were places where ends were still sticking out the salvage edge. So those sorts of things need to be um, taken care of. Um, and I'm, I'm assuming since they used the um, overlap burying method that those were just ends that could have been quickly trimmed off and, and created a better presentation. But, you know, it's a learning process, right? And it's a lovely shawl. Um, it has nice wearability. Uh, you can see that it moves a bit more, a little bit more stiffly and wet finishing will probably increase that stiffness in this case because the yarns will full and probably make the fabric a little less bendy. But I do, I do want to actually come back. This is my favorite hem stitching method of all she, the weaver used. Um, uh, uh, it's a buttonhole style. It looks stitch, beautiful. And it just looks beautiful. This is an incredibly fine job of Finishing and this look shawl. at how nicely that hem stitching is right just up against up. the fell, which is perfect. It means it's going to be stable for years. Fabulous. Without a knot. So this one is not knotted on top of the hem stitching. Mm -hmm. This has only hem stitching as it's finished. And that but... means that the edge has a really nice feel. It doesn't have that feel of coming down and hitting the knots, which feel a little bit like a... Can feel. They can. They can. Um, but this... this 
creates a very soft finish at the edge of the shawl, which is really lovely. Um, okay. I think that's what we've got on this one. So let's see their video. Yeah, before we hit the video, just one quick yep. little thing to mention. Yep. Uh, our two judges saw the video as it was originally submitted, but we did have to remove some of the music due to copyright rules on YouTube. Uh, okay. So there will be some silent parts. So uh, if you guys are hearing that, there was some, some choice music in there. I think it worked for the ambiance and it was really nice, but just considering that this is going on video and or I'm going on YouTube and the video is going on YouTube, we did have to silence those sections. So uh, the judges did get to see it in its original form. We're going to hear it and there's going to be some silent parts. So don't think that your video is cutting out or, or something like that. Okay. And with that, if we're ready to roll the video, we can go ahead. Hi, I'm Lynn. Today we are carding and prepping and spinning fleece from Nancy Burns at Miracle Peak Ranch. The beautiful colored, natural colored Corydale in a dark, dark chocolate brown. Uh, I am loading the locks onto my Clemens and Clemens pan cards and carding up little backs that I'm stacking up uh, to turn into spinnable fiber. Hi, I'm Amy from Stin City. I am also uh, prepping uh, this Cordale fiber. I am using a lock pop from Clemens and Clemens to open up each lock to um, kind of attenuate it and make it into spinnable fiber. Uh, it really does not take much effort uh, between the great quality of the fleece and the tool. Um, just a couple little passes um, on the lock top per lock really uh, opens them up and gets me ready for the next step. Okay, hi, I'm Christina from Spin City and I have completed carding all of my fiber, stacked it up into mini bats, and now I'm going to roll them up like a burrito. Hopefully you can see what I'm doing. And I'm rolling them into a semi-worsted preparation. So all of the fibers are gonna be aligned parallel this way. And what I'm gonna do is kind of start drafting from the end here. And I'm gonna use my little diz to keep the roving consistent. So I'll just pull that through the hole. And this is gonna be a nice chunky roving, easy to spin from. And just attenuate the fiber through the hole in the diz. And nothing crazy here. I'm not trying to be perfect. It's just everything is nicely aligned. So this fiber fits, this fiber spins like a dream. <laughs> and then once I'm finished, and I'm just gonna roll it up into a little nest. And then I'll have my fiber all prepped and I'll be ready to spin. So here's the last part. And then just gonna roll it up into a nest. And here's my spinning basket ready to go. <laughs> yeah.
Jasmine, take it away. Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Jasmine. Um, I've already finished all of my fiber prep, so I'm already spinning. Um, I'm spinning on my electric eel six, and I'm taking all of this. Ah out all the fun bits that don't want to actually be in our final yarn. Um, so I'm taking, I did the same prep as Christina described, and now I'm currently spitting those up. I am hem stitching in groups of six. I'm doing that to secure the salvage, the edge of the shawl. I did a about an inch of plain weave at the beginning. Just to provide a sturdy edge for the hem stitching. all right it was more fun with the music but i i, I completely get um <laughs> how that happened so this is a good note to people making videos for future competitions to make sure that you check for your um copyright information on any music that you want to use because and all or make sure that there's some kind of sound stimulation going on in the video because video we have to think not just of information 
or what we Visual. see, but we also have to deal with the auditory. So that's a good thought for anybody making a video. Make sure there's either talking music, information, information, music, something. Yeah. And and I will say uh, just a couple of things. Uh, this is the first time we've done the virtual component where we send them the video on. So that's a little bit, it's a little bit on, on us as far as the festival, as far as not being clear about, oh, hey, you know, we did say they were going on YouTube. We, we didn't really think to specify that we couldn't have copyrighted material. Uh, but we, we have given that team the option to put in some non-copyrighted video before we post it to uh, YouTube on our account. Uh, so we will give them that option. And then also uh, the judging as far as uh, what Kay and Sand here have decided in terms of uh, who's going to be uh, the award winner for the video, that was done with the sound included. So yeah, uh, at, at this point now, we have seen photos and video of all three shawls. And before we get to the placement of the shawls, we're going to talk about the video. So which of those three videos, Kay and Sand, uh, was your best video? And, and tell us a little bit about why you could. So our, our first place video um, is the video for team two, um, two which is Hangtown. Or Sorry, is that team one? Yep, yeah, no, that's team, no, one. team one. Team one. Team one. Yeah, Hang Hang, Hangtown was team one. Hangtown, <laughs> Hangtown <laughs> produced the best video. Um, and while all three videos gave us the information requested in the um, rules, in the rules, which was to demonstrate the design, construction, and creation of their shawl, um, we felt like Hangtown had um, really superb editing. They used a really lovely mix of stills and video footage. They um, found music that kept a nice, even um, sound and volume quality throughout the entire video. Um, and rather than trying to um, uh, jump back and forth between live voice and music or um, narration. narration, voiceover narration. Um, they chose to use a um, a system of of uh, text on screen, text on screen titles. And in um, terms of presentations for a video, it was really, really superior. They that choice of using text only really works in a visual format like a YouTube video. So it was really well done, and I think that would. Um, be a good example for teams to look at in the future. A couple of the things that they specifically did that I would like to see as um, things going forward for other teams making videos are they did a really lovely shot of measuring their shawl. So they showed a tape measure of both width and length. Um, and they um, and they showed up close-ups of the end of the tape measure. You could really see that, in fact, they had measured the shawl mm -hmm. per the requirements to mm -hmm. do so. And showing things like the weights they used to keep the fringe nice and even. And they used those weights to weight out the shawl in order to get the measurement. Those are all really beautiful details in terms of videography. Mm -hmm. So that was extremely well done. Um, the, the one thing that I will say I would have liked to have seen is that they didn't credit their music um, either in the um, YouTube notes or on screen. Um, and I would have liked to see that. Um, clearly, they used music that was um, in the public domain, which is fantastic. Um, but it's always nice to credit what you use. Um, but other than that, um, great job. And I will say great job to all three teams for producing really lovely videos. Um, but Hangtown, job well done. So congratulations to Hangtown for winning the first award or first competition uh, of Lambtown Festival 2022. And uh, before we move on to uh, our placements for the shawls themselves, uh, Kay, you mentioned uh, giving credit where it's due. I do want to thank Gina Clemens, my beautiful wife, for the photography of the shawls that we've been looking at. 
Aces. Uh, as as you said that, I I thought, well, how on earth did I forget to thank her on that final slide when I thanked everyone else? So Gina, my apologies. Hopefully you'll you'll forgive me one day. Uh, and uh, thank you for all the wonderful photography. So with that, if we're ready, uh, we can go ahead and uh, take a look at where everybody ended up here. Okay, here we go. Bring it over. Oh, here we go. There we go. All right, so here's a look at all three of them. And this is gonna play a little bit. And I okay. think then we get to see their names and then it'll pop into a slide of who came in second place. <clears throat> okay. So, hey, if you hold up the shawl just briefly. Right. Oh, there it is. Yeah. yeah, it's a beautiful shawl. It's really a, a lovely presentation. So I, I'm very pleased. I love to see how it's gonna, this team will grow in the future. That's always a wonderful thing. Did you wanna hold up the shawl you said? Yeah, just, you know, because it's nice to see it moving because you can't tell that from a still, although you can tell a lot about the drape interestingly, but the movement is so nice. And I do think that the colors were really well chosen. I would like to see the pattern placed with cognizance of the stripe widths a little bit more, but even so, I think that it is a really lovely piece and certainly would be a very marketable piece. Well done. Okay. Keep going. Congratulations, <laughs> Hangtown. Yep. All right, and are we ready now to uh, reveal the winner? Mm -hmm. Okay, I didn't mean to make these slides so suspenseful. They're running a little bit longer than I thought, but that it is what it is. So here we are. We're gonna we're gonna a little bit longer view at second place here, and then we'll roll into the the winner. It's a nice shot of how even and lovely the fringe is. So that's a it's a nice one to look at. All three shawls had nice fringe. I love the drape, the cowl drape around the neck on this one. I feel like I should be playing the drum roll. But... <laughs> <laughs> That's the next slide. There's your drum roll. <laughs> Long suspense. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't mean to make it this suspenseful, I promise. Yay! Congratulations! Take and hold the shawl up briefly while we're waiting for the photos to pop up. Oh, it was nice. You could see them. Oh, look at that. And now you can see the photo on the right really shows the wing presentation. It's it's beautiful. It really showed up beautifully in that. And the tool they chose actually creates kind of a feathered effect, which adds to um, the overall design. Which when you see it in the draped cowl version in the photo on the left, you can really tell that it doesn't matter that someone else might not see the beautiful painted design when it's worn because of crushability and it's folding. However, the twill looks gorgeous on its own. It's a beautiful presentation, even in that position where it's folded up. So it's just a really, really well done. And you can really see how lovely the selvages are. So thanks. That was gorgeous, you guys. <laughs> Absolutely, folks, everybody, it was, they, they were all lovely. They were all lovely. Really lovely. And, and I will note that, you know, sampling pays off. 
more it, sampling. Do, do you want to hold the shawl up and talk about anything, anything else specifically about it? G gush a little that, bit more. I mean, it, it, really, <laughs> it really shows the benefit of the sampling. Um, this, by the way, is is from it being folded, so that there's not an error there. It, the benefit of sampling here really shows because then you know how things are going to behave and it makes a huge difference in your outcome. Mm -hmm. And keep in mind, teams, that your sampling does not count in your time for making yeah. the shawl. Sample, 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 sample. And if you, you know, as we watched the video um, for this team, it was clear from the um, initial sample dyeing that they made shifts to their final shawl. Um, based on that sampling. So um, understanding what happened when you do your sampling gives you the ability to make choices on your final product. Oh, hold happening. up the center though. I really, oh, really yeah. want to show this center in, in movement because even when it's moving a little bit, and I'll just give it a little bit of movement here, you can really see how beautiful the pattern turn is to highlight the center of the wingspan. It's just it's really yeah, gorgeous. They really side. did a nice job. And there are no treadling errors on this shawl, which is really, really important on something like this. So it has a very, um, a very, uh, it's very impactful when you see it, when you, when you actually open it up, the visual impact and the hand is good. It's a nice combination of squishy, comforting and still good and drapey. So they really did a nice job. They actually got done in time to have a, um, as hand, hand finishing. Yeah, hand finishing. So they did a really nice job of that. And yeah. sampling also means your teams are able to produce faster, which means you can start to incorporate more things like spray finishing, you know, wet misting finishing and hand fulling. If, if your team is experienced and you've done that sampling, you got the practice under your belt that the things start to actually happen faster so you can incorporate more things. Finishing techniques at yeah. the end, which allows you to present a more finished shawl. Yeah, it so, makes a huge but, difference. Um, so congratulations to Lamb Chop, um, Spin Along, uh, well done. And congratulations to all three teams. You all did fantastically well and I, Hats off on the video presentation because that is not in my skill set. So I have all kinds of uh, well done props for that. Yeah, well, let me mention since since we have some winners now, let me mention uh, we got a uh, prize basket. We'll go to Hangtown for uh, the video and and also uh, the second place finish, and then first place gets a hundred dollars. So congrats to. Lamb chops spin along on that. And then we also have $100 for the grand champion. So when uh, the lamb chop spin along uh, shawl goes head to head against the, the fairground division, uh, they have another shot at $100. Also wanted to mention that these shawls will be on display in the East Classroom building uh, throughout the festival. Uh, we'll try and get them up um, on Thursday and Friday. So they're actually there uh, during the workshop. So if you have a little break uh, from the workshop, pop on over to the, the East building. And we'll be bringing honest. them in on Thursday. So they'll be okay. available on Thursday. Perfect. Uh, and yeah. yeah, please, everybody come take a look at them. It's well yes. worth yes. having yes. a look at these, all three of them. And uh, we have a just a, a little bit of time here and a couple of questions came in. If anybody has any other uh, questions that they'd like to ask, um, I'll take the first one here is, uh, where is where's each team from? And uh, Hangtown, uh, the Hangtown Fiber Miners are from Placerville. Uh, Spin City, which is the uh, team number three, they are from uh, the New York City area. Uh, so it's really fun to see them compete. It's awesome uh, that they bought a California fleece to compete with uh, in New York. So appreciate them uh, supporting us out here. And then the other team, uh, Lamb Chop Spin Along, is from the Seattle area. So all over the place. And I think that's one of the coolest things about. Uh, this virtual yeah. division is that we can we can bring people together who don't have a chance to make it out here for Lambtown Festival and, and they actually get to compete with us and compete head to head with a, a fairgrounds team. So that's really cool. Uh, the other question that I have here is for you two, Kay and Sand. It says, uh, do you notice a difference in spin consistency with e-spinners 
versus the traditional spinning wheels when looking at the different shawls. Just curious. No, and in fact, that opens up something that came up as we were watching the videos. When you prep your fiber to spin the weft, well, this is true, the warp too. The difference in the yarns came in the preparation, not the type of wheel used. You can produce the same yarns, treadled versus e-spinner, but the preparation differed. And in that video, we could see that the resulting yarns were different because the singles result uh, showed how the fiber prep went and they were different only subtly, but enough that you can see it. So this is just a reminder that um, Roy <clears throat> offers uh, fantastic classes in drum carding. And that is your key to good fiber prep. Yeah. Um, uh, obviously, you know, hand, hand parts, parts. lock pops, all of these things are really fantastic tools. But the consistency and the preparation from spinner to spinner is the thing that's going to have a much larger impact on the resulting singles. And the other thing that's going to have a huge impact on your resulting yarn is how well your plier is able to take compensate those singles and compensate for any differences in um, twist angle and um, diameter in creating your, um, your finished yarns. So your spinners need to all use the same fiber prep technique. It does make a difference. And this is a place where the virtual can differ from the live. When we're doing a shape to shawl live and in person, you have, everybody's doing the same technique. I mean, you might have a, a drum carter running at the same time as hand cards, but they're all producing roughly the same prep. And in the end, once people start spinning, you get down to one person who is the primary carter who continues. So that prep will be consistent because it's being done the same way by the same person. When in this virtual format where each spinner gets sent the fiber and their does their own prep. Does their own prep. Now, a team could have one person do all the preps, but if they're, each spinner is doing their own prep, they must really please use the same preparation technique. It makes a difference in your resulting yarn. And that's where the difference is, not whether it was an e-spinner or a treadled wheel. You can get the same yarn out of any yeah. spinning wheel um, in the world if you are a competent spinner. Um, I can spin I, lace I, weight on a country spinner. <laughs> so, it, you know, and, and I can spin the same lace weight on an electric jumbo versus a treadled jumbo. So you can make whatever yarn you want if you know how your wheel works, but it will how have you a different- prep it is really the key. Yeah. And, you know, so get on over and take that class from Roy about- Hey, hey now. Hey, now. We, have, we have lots of good instructors at-, at We do. We and, do. and in uh, fact, I think Stephanie's offering us uh, spinning for weaving. So uh, yes, yes, spinning for weaving. Because there is are great specific class things exactly. you want to think about when you're doing yeah. that. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. So another and, great class to take. It and and it was interesting that that question led us there. You guys are talking about uh, uh, the difference between uh, kind of the what might happen at the fairgrounds or what might happen virtually. Well, we had a, mm -hmm. a question come in here. And I don't know how true that, I mean, it is, but a little bit. So this question came in. So conditions for weaving at home versus at the festival are really different. Uh, uh, the example is a complex treadling would be hard at the festival. Uh, will that be taken into account when comparing the two best shawls? And I, I think you have to kind of take into account all the differences there are between virtual and, and fairground submission. But I, I'd love to hear what, what you two have to say about that. So specifically, the complication of treadling, it, there is a little bit of a difference between the in-person where you might have people talking to you and bothering you. Distractions. And distractions, yeah. And at home, you're probably going to have less of that, although most of us at home have other distractions. But the level of complexity of the treadling, I feel like has a lot more to do with your choices about the design of the shawl. When you're designing a shawl like this, you're up against a time crunch whether it's in person or virtual, they only had so many hours in which to do this piece of production. So 
picking something, a pattern that will present well with your warp and your weft and is a pattern that will be easy enough for the weaver to accomplish in a good technical manner in a, at the, time. At, in a limited time. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, complex enough to highlight, to feature the yarns that were used. So for instance, in the shawls that we just saw, and we'll see what happens when we get to the um, in-person component, um, twills that have um, extended points or turn at some point um, are great choices because the treadling patterns are relatively straightforward, um, but you get a lot of bang for being able to flip it and go back the other way or um, come up to a point and come back down and, and things like that. So in that way, the kind of draft that you would want to choose for an in-person um, versus a virtual is not as different as you might think. And this is another place where a thing that does not count against your hours to produce, sampling, sampling, sampling. And this, in this case, we're talking about not just sampling a pattern, but sampling a whole piece the same size as you want your resulting piece to be, because you need to know that the weaver can accomplish that weaving in a certain time frame. So you would track your hours, the weaver would, to know that they'd met a certain time frame. Practicing to whether or not they could treadle that pattern through a whole piece with even and consistent beat, no treadling errors, avoiding picks practice. This is another place where practice becomes the difference. And that practice is available to virtual teams and to the teams who are competing on site. Ideally, they've done all that practice before they went on site. And in fact, I think that becomes even more critical for in-person teams to do practicing and sampling because you are absolutely going to have some additional distractions. distractions. Yeah. Um, so having practiced your draft and actually woven with that draft and, and have it kind of set into muscle memory becomes even more critical. And in that respect, practicing it in the sampling is not necessarily enough. You do wanna practice through at least one whole piece because that will tell you as the weaver whether you can do that through the whole thing. You know, are you gonna be able to stay consistent? And, it, and this is actually, particularly critical for in-person. And this is one of the places where it does differ because one of the things that is true about the virtual competition is that you do not have to weave straight through from the beginning to the end in one go. You can take breaks, you can uh, weave on you know, different days or whatever. So you do have a little bit of an advantage in that regard. Once you um, start in person- You're straight if, through. Yeah, you're straight through. Once um, the weaver begins, the weaver is weaving straight through. They really don't get to take a break of any kind and or it won't get done. They have, to, they have to make sure that whatever break they take is within their time limit. And it's, But the other thing that is true, if you're weaving straight through, you are probably going to be able to keep your beat level throughout if, if you've practiced. And here's where the clock makes the practice so mm -hmm. critical because the clock is going off, putting pressure yeah. on you because you are the final component really of this of the process team. you need to get done in time for whatever has to happen with the fringe to get done before it goes to the judge and so that pressure can cause people to start beating tighter and tighter and tighter i don't mm -hmm. think i've ever seen one finish where it got looser they just get tighter but uh, on the other hand if you're doing a virtual competition and you are weaving in um, multiple sessions you do have to make sure that you come back and that you can reestablish at the same beat. Because the downside um, there is that when you come back from your you break- You may be beating lighter. Yeah, that's usually where we see um, a lighter beat. And sometimes it's where we see a treadling error because you lost track of where you were. When you got up to go have lunch, you came back and then you were like, Oh, did I, I stop at pick three or pick four? And because you're under a time constraint, and this is true for both pieces, because you're under a time constraint, you don't necessarily notice that error until you're so far beyond it that you can't come back and recap and fix it. So, so that's, that's yeah. what we have to say on yeah. that. Thank you. I, I loved the, uh, 
depth of the answer always from both of you. Uh, so the person who did ask the question said thank you for that. Uh, a couple more questions came in and I'll, I'll field both of them. The first one is how many teams will be weaving uh, in the fairgrounds division? So far we have just three. Uh, so that'll be our smaller uh, fairgrounds division. Uh, but you can still enter. In a while, but exactly. But registration is still open. So hopefully we inspired you a little bit. Get seven of your friends together. Uh, throw a warp on the loom and, and get on down to the fairgrounds next Sunday. So still lots of time to enter. I have a, I have a thought about that one. Please, Ooh. teams, if you want to get going on it, you want to take part in this, please note that there is nothing wrong with plain weave. A carefully chosen warp and weft with interest can absolutely make a well-executed plain weave just shine. So please don't hesitate to come and do plain weave, which you would maybe probably be easier to get at a last minute to be able to do. So please, your plain weave shawls, come on and do those. At, and at the same time, there's nothing wrong with not finishing. There's nothing wrong with having, you know, a, a shawl that's a little short or a little narrow. There's nothing wrong with that. Lots of, of great experience just from coming out. I mean, you don't expect to win every game you ever play, right? So come on out and, and compete. Great experience. It's really a friendly competition. And the experience and knowledge that you'll get out of it is so huge. And it's just marvelous. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And one of, the, one of the lovely things about doing a competition is that you will get feedback from the judges in, you know, either the virtual or the in-person. And that will hopefully, the goal Help from our grow. perspective is to help you grow as a weaver and a spinner and you know just really um, bump up your skill level in your craft and the more teams we have the more exciting it is for the audience too that's true and uh one last question came in here and I, i'm sad to say that the answer to this question is no but it was will the fairground sheep to shawl uh judging be shown live streamed and it, it will not this year that's something we were working on uh it, it just didn't come through uh, like I said, a lot of things this year are still real fluid. Uh, planning a festival post-COVID is a lot different from planning one pre-COVID. Uh, but some of those virtual components like that are something that I'd love to get to at some point in the future. But there's always the option of driving on down. <laughs> and really, you will learn so much if you watch the, the, the live judging. You will learn a lot from watching it. So even if you if you want to put a team in for next year, Come watch that judging because it will. It'll inform your, your so process much. for next year. Yeah. For sure. That's it. So. Okay. All right. And with that, I'd like to say thank you to both of our judges. Thank you to all three of uh, our competitors. Uh, I want to say thank you to uh, Kira and Rigel, who did a lot of the work behind the scenes here to make this Sheep to Shawl competition happen. Thank you to Gina for taking all the photos. And uh, last but not least, just a couple of reminders uh, about the festival. Uh, it is coming up here October 1st and 2nd. Uh, parking is free. Uh, admission is $10 a day or 15 for the weekend. We also have our $40 super supporter. If you wanna get a little bit of extra swag, you can pre-order your merchandise. We have workshops starting on Thursday. Lots of great workshops like we talked about. If you're interested in Sheep to Shawl, Sheep to Shawl, the, the spinning for weaving is a really great workshop. Uh, these shawls that you just saw right now, you'll be able to see them in person in the East build, uh, East Classrooms building at the fairgrounds, and they'll be there all weekend long, actually starting on Thursday, like we said, on display, so you can come and check them out with, with your own eyes, not through a computer. And what else? Oh, that's right, the head-to-head -head, uh, on uh, Sunday at 3 p.m. Once the fairgrounds division is judged, then you'll be able to uh, see them go head-to-head, -head and we'll get a grand champion. and. Uh, see whether or not this one takes out the fairgrounds uh, division or, or who claims that first crown. So this new style of competition that we have. So I will say that you might have an idea that the virtual, because they're doing stuff at home and they're not under, they're under a different kind of time constraint, people assume it will be better quality. And again, we're back to practice. So I just want to, you, this is my favorite soapbox. Practice and sampling could make an on-site team come up with as lovely a final result as our winning shawl here in virtual. So it's really about practice. 
There you go. And thanks to you, Roy, for hosting this. Yes, for thank you so much. Keeping this festival going uh, <laughs> in these really stressful times. And uh, we look forward to seeing you uh, next Thursday. Yeah, we'll see you all in just a few days. Thank you to everyone who has watched. And uh, more information uh, about the festival is available at lambtown.org. And we hope to see you in person. I'll sign off there. Thank you, everybody. Bye.